So as it works for you, beginning to find a comfortable posture for your body so that when those bells start, you can attune to them and receive them and begin to cultivate this practice of receptive awareness and noticing how the heart, mind, and body respond to what is being observed. Right? We might have a practice of returning. Noticing how it feels in the heart, mind, and body to receive the various arising and passing experiences. and noticing your relationship or how you are relating to that which is being observed or recognized. cultivating awareness of the full range of experience of our lives. And in this moment, tuning into ourselves to notice what's alive in us, what's here, what are we arriving with? Or in our everyday language, how are you?
And if a lot arises, distilling that down to one word. And if there's not much there, kind of broadening and settling down and back a little bit more so that you might discern what is here and how you are doing. Tired, anxious, excited, happy, sad, restless, settled, or many, many more experiences might be possible. We'll enjoy two sounds of the bell from my bell and then broaden out into the group. And one more for good measure as a reminder of the practice of receiving, receiving the sound of the bell and noticing how the heart, mind and body respond. Observing the residue or the impact and broadening this awareness into the field of movement, inviting the body to move in whatever ways feel good at this moment in time, really practicing listening in to your own heart, your own gut, your own body. to discern how the body might want to move, might be little movements or large movements. Maybe you want to stand up or take a big stretch or maybe you're good just as you are. Only you know, but only you can know. So taking the time to tune in and discern. And again, like, oh, what's the residue? Sayadaw Utejaniya offers that everything leaves a residue. I think that we forget that. And in exploring the, the precepts and in noticing the effects of our actions, this is a really beautiful, vast area to be exploring. Like, well, what's the residue of this intention or of this action? And we'll go around the group as I like to do and introduce yourselves, introduce ourselves and share a word, you know, how are you, what's up, and we don't need a whole sentence, really the silence is just a word, so name, pronouns, and then whatever that word might be for you. So Augusta, she, her, peace. And we will go to Brendan and go around and pick up Zoom and then end with Francis. I'm Brendan, um, he, him, and I think I am okay. Okay. Yeah. Pulling it back from the habit of a sentence to just your word. Hmm. Hi, I'm Ron, he, him. Hmm. 
content. Great. And then over to Tia, and then Tia, if you can pass the mic around until we've gotten to everyone. And of course, you don't have to come in, so we'll give you a little space, and if you choose not to come in, we'll figure it out, or Tia will figure it out and let me know. Yeah, um, so uh, you can, um, I'll ask folks to go if they're up for it, and you can speak then. Uh, you can put it in the chat and I'll read it out, or you can just pass entirely and you can say pass in the chat, or you can say pass with your voice when we get to you. Um, and my name is Tia. Uh, she or they are fine for me and uncomfortable. Uh, Anne, are you up for going next? I'm Anne. My pronouns are she and her, and I would say peaceful. Walt, are you up for going next? Mind passing the mic. Yeah. Walt, are you up for going next? Walt, uh, he, him. And this evening I'm fatigued. Uh, how about uh, John R? John and Tyre and passing on to Tom. Uh, hi, Tom, he, him, lethargic. And how about Ivy? Hi, I'm Ivy, she, her, grateful. How about passing it on to, I can't have my glasses on, Ginger, Ginniger, Kimberly. Hi, it's Kim, um, she, her, and patient. Wonderful. Thank you, Zoom land. Everybody participated. Appreciate that. Hi, I'm Frances, she, her. And uh, content. Wonderful. Yeah, so tuning in and then noticing, you can just leave that over there. Yeah, great. How it feels now, right? Was there presence as we received one another, or did the idea of awareness or presence kind of fade into the background as we were with the content? That's fine. And it's a practice. And so I'll remember as much as I remember to mention it for you and occasionally it will arise for you on its own as it becomes a practice it's kind of cool there's a lot of ways to practice meditation way way bigger than just buddhism and in buddhism there's a lot of ways to practice meditation and this approach that i've been engaging in as a student the last few years and bringing it into my teaching just recently with this receptive awareness rather than trying to do something or trying to make something happen has been so impactful for me. And so, as I said, I'm new to teaching this particular flavor, so it might be a little bit clunky some of the time, and we'll, we'll grow in it together. And you can be aware of anything. It's amazing. Even these unpleasant habits of mind that have maybe been with us forever, when there's awareness that meets them when they show up, and it's just like, oh, that can be kind of an excitement about being aware of it. And that story that, you know, used to, or still often just kind of grabs you and knocks you over, it doesn't have that charge anymore as there's this like, oh, hi. And so it's simply a practice of cultivating awareness. Carol Wilson, a, a senior insight teacher, early, early, early part of the Inside Meditation Society in Barry, Massachusetts. She says, mindfulness doesn't care what it's mindful of, which I just love. And I have said that many times, been aware of that phrase for a long time, but it's taken on this really new meaning for me as I've experienced for myself directly that like, it really doesn't. And that when the mindfulness is actually present, there's contentment, there's peace, there's ease, even if there is also discomfort or fatigue or tiredness or agitation or 
whatever. It's like, what? You know, mindfulness can hold it. For when we're mindful, mindfulness itself is a wholesome mind state, a wholesome heart state. And it's huge. I remember in one of my early times teaching her at the collective, I think Brendan might have even been here for that. I brought out a flip chart and I drew this whole diagram from Thich Nhat Hanh. And so Ty, he draws this huge, well, when he was alive and still through his students, draws this huge circle with a little line through it. And there's all these little seeds or bija at the bottom. And something happens in life, pleasant or unpleasant, because of our response to it. But the thing happens, loud sound, let's call it a loud sound. Loud sound occurs, boop, there's awareness of this loud sound. And immediately, for most of us, most of the time, there's um, some aversion <laughs> that shows up in response to that. There's a not liking. Maybe we're startled, maybe we're scared, maybe we're just agitated. Like it can be different degrees. Or maybe we've gotten out to see fireworks and we're expecting a loud sound. And so there's just joy and delight. Right, so we can have a very different response to the loud sound depending on the other conditions, which is another key word in this approach, the conditions that surround the moment. But when mindfulness shows up to meet it, it doesn't matter anymore what the thing is, because mindfulness is here holding it. And Ty would say that if it's a wholesome mind state, and mindfulness meets it, when it goes back down, it goes back down in a way that it's more available. And if it's an unwholesome mind state and mindfulness meets it, it goes back down and it goes down in a way that it becomes less available. Kind of like the magic of a thermos. You know the thermos keeps the object hot or it keeps the object cold. It's just its natural state because it's a wholesome mind state. The natural impact of mindfulness is to lead toward more wholesomeness. Right? It doesn't have to like figure out, oh, is this a wholesome mindset or not a wholesome mindset? It's just what happens. And as we have the intention just to cultivate mindfulness or cultivate awareness, I'm using those words interchangeably at the moment to refer to the Pali term sati, to cultivate presence. Presence is more available. So we'll, we'll settle into meditation in a formal way, in a minute, or in an intentional way, in a minute. Carol also suggested to me recently maybe to see if I could find freedom from the word formal, just for my own heart, mind, body. So we'll see how that happens in the Plum Village world. We talk about formal and informal practice a lot. But I wonder if creating that dichotomy for myself has maybe not been super supportive. So we'll see how my language continues to evolve so that every moment is practice. We're cultivating awareness all the time. And the last thing that I'll say now before we settle down again or settle in again more deeply, while we're continuing to be aware, like noticing what's the impact, how's the heart, mind, body responding, like each time we can remember, right, maybe on Zoom you heard that, I just touched the microphone, like did you notice a response in the body, in the mind, in the heart? Right? Was there like oh, a little bit of annoyance or was there a little bit of acceptance or a little bit of both or did you miss it entirely? Like what's actually happening? Is your interest increasing or decreasing? How's your body doing? Like we can attune to ourselves anytime, anywhere. And I feel like, I mean, there's probably a long list of unfortunate things. And I feel like one of the many unfortunate things is this way that we've become so separate from, disconnected from our own hearts, minds, and bodies. Not attuning to what we might need in the moment, right? This habit of pushing through, which, you know, maybe in a moment for a brief period of time, but we just keep going and going and going until there's a really big catastrophe and we have to stop. Or some of us stop at a small catastrophe, you know, we've gotten a little sick or something. But as we practice to tune in, become more aware, it's like, oh, we start to notice. And there's more of a habit to tend to it and care for it rather than just push on through because we have been tracking what's the impact of that, what's the residue of that experience. Are you aware? As we encourage ourselves to be aware 
the awareness starts and not that it's going to happen tonight and it might take a while maybe I'll have a moment tonight the awareness starts to gain its own momentum its own momentum it's you know kind of like being on a swing right you have the highs and the lows and the ups and the downs and the coming and the going and there's this continual movement and at first either you're getting a push or you're pumping your legs there's some personal effort or there's some external effort and you're going and going and going but then after a while you get going and you can just ride it you don't have to pump anymore you don't have to get a push and then it starts to fade and then you pump your legs again or get another push and that's how this practice can be and that the push it's toward awareness itself right awareness of picking up the cup or bringing the food the food into the mouth or it scratching the itch it's like oh whatever it is that's happening i can be curious about that interested in that and so rather than just for this practice period continue of course in your own practice as you wish but i'll be exposing you tonight and in the subsequent weeks So during this practice period, practicing to notice awareness, how it feels to be aware, recognizing perhaps a range of objects of awareness. And so if there's any coming back to anything, it's just like, oh, aware, right? Rather than like coming back to the breath or something specific like that, that you may have practiced in the past or you may choose to practice in the future, all right? So check in with that body again, see if you want to stretch or move, stand up or lay down. Have one more sip or bite, taking care of your body, taking care of your heart, taking care of your mind. I love to take my glasses off when I'm wearing glasses. But you do what works for you. I also often find that I want a little bit more warmth when I settle into stillness. Sometimes the body cools off a bit and I wish I had gotten a blanket or maybe you're starting to get warm. When I'm teaching, I also get warm. So noticing what's actually happening for your body, right? Not the idea of it or how it was before, but what's happening now. When the mind might be going, assessing, judging, Doing some future, some past, no problem. This is what the mind does. And when we are aware with that, we are aware. I'll invite the bell to bring us in and and a bunch more words and some silence. We'll sit for about 35 minutes. One more wake up sound in honor of the plum village tradition of Thich Nhat Hanh. And then three full invitations of the bell. But first, I'd like to invite you to invite the body to rest. Can you simply rest and notice if the posture might need to change in any way so that you're supported in resting with alertness. So lengthen the spine is quite helpful. Crown of the head reaching out or up, depending on whether you're lying down or are in a vertical posture, broadening the shoulders. And 
and attuning, beginning by attuning to this experience of the body resting. Resting and receiving the sound of the bell. With an open heart and mind curious about the experience internally as you receive this external vibration. Noticing how it feels inside. Maybe beginning with the experience of the body resting. Noticing if there's any interest in that experience. Or maybe attention is drawn to the experience of hearing. Or 
aware of the impact of that. or aware of the experience of hearing. Or maybe a thought arises in the mind. We can know that. And we can know how the heart-mind, how the gut responds to that thought. We can observe contraction and ease in the heart, in the gut, in the body. Okay, it's like that. Or my favorite shorthand, hi there. Noticing what's actually a happening, noticing what's actually arising or what's actually happening internally and externally. And our relationship to all of that. We might be able to feel and get interested in the Subtle leaning toward or pushing away. It's just a natural conditioned experience, a natural conditioned response. This too can be known. Opening, receiving, the direct experience of each arising and passing present moment. And sometimes it gets kind of squirrely. You can always refresh mindfulness. It can be helpful to remember 
The first job of the yogi, as offered by Saira Utejaniya. Yata Bhuta, things as they have come to be. It's all conditioned. So maybe we're not feeling settled. No problem, it's conditioned. All right, and we can recognize those conditions. And in that recognition of the conditions, sometimes there's some peace. Oh yeah, it's like that. Because life keeps happening. We don't get to stop the tumbling forward of experience. That's not the goal. We can practice to be with and meet this ever-changing flow. And through that practice, freedom is found. Oh, it's all conditioned. The delight, the squirreliness, the ease, the fatigue, the agitation, the peace, it's all conditioned. And here we are gathered together creating wholesome conditions for ourselves and one another. Allowing ourselves to feel that, appreciate that. If that's available, not trying to make anything happen, but rather resting and receiving. Maybe beginning to notice moments when mindfulness returns on its own. I invite you to notice how that feels, to become curious about the residue or the residual experience that's there. When mindfulness returns, Whatever was occurring before that moment, the residue of that is often able to be recognized. Just feeling the body, the heart, the gut. Maybe there's appreciation for the return of mindfulness. Maybe there's an emotion because of the thought that was occurring or the external experience that preceded the moment of mindfulness. Can we know what's here now? Can we practice to meet ourselves in each moment with kindness? with care, with interest. Occasionally pushing that swing or pumping your legs, the second job of the yogi, aware, Occasionally reminding ourselves, what are you aware of? What am I noticing? What's here? What is being received? Finding your own language, borrowing some of mine. Open, alert, curious, receptive.
And the third job of a yogi is to simply continue. So at any time you can refresh your practice by inviting the body to rest, maybe tuning in to that experience of settling that happens quite naturally when we get out of the way. It's kind of the foundation. And first job. Oh, it's conditioned. This moment, this human, this experience, it's conditioned. Aware. Getting interested, attuning to the experience of awareness itself. And continue. Receiving. Resting. Every once in a while, checking your relationship
your relationship to the present moment, your relationship to what is known. What Saira Utejaniya calls the attitude, noticing if greed is present, or wanting more, or wanting things to be better, chasing after, wanting something to happen. Noticing if greed is present. Noticing if aversion is present or resisting or pushing away and wanting something to stop happening or not liking. Noticing how the experience feels in the heart, in the gut, can be a beautiful way into recognizing the relationship. Noticing contraction or ease. wise attitude or right attitude is our ability to meet things as they are. It's like, oh, okay, it's like this. Can feel like contentment or peace or ease or a simple okayness. Freedom basically is the absence of or freedom from greed and aversion. That wanting always to make things just how we want them to be. The exhaustion, giving up that exhausting effort, that futile effort, letting it go. Oh, tired, okay, no problem. Uncomfortable, no problem. So much freedom in that. We're not trying to make that happen. What we're doing is cultivating awareness. For as awareness is cultivated and sustained, wisdom arises naturally. And wisdom does the work of letting go of greed and aversion. We don't do it. It's not ours to do. The practice unfolds. The only doing is showing up and setting the intention to be mindful and remembering occasionally.
simply noticing that you are aware occasionally. Maybe noticing or getting interested in the experience of the heart center, tracking contraction or ease. And being okay with it either way, whatever is here. Through our practice, the mind becomes like a clear forest pool. All kinds of strange and wonderful animals may come to drink. We can see their reflection. They can see their reflection. And the mind, the heart, this being is simply still receiving these experiences arising and passing. Not getting tossed around. In time with practice, This is the natural course of things. No need to do anything except show up, set aside the time, and set the intention to cultivate mindfulness, presence, awareness.
remembering that we can refresh sati, mindfulness, awareness, we can refresh sati anytime that it arises that might be helpful. Reestablishing the intention to rest, cultivating the experience of rest in the body. Remembering that first yogi job, oh, it's conditioned. <laughs> Yata Buddha, things as they have come to be. The second job, aware. Or maybe already aware or awareing, making it an active verb, awareing. And third, yogi job to continue. And the rest unfolds naturally due to causes and conditions. And as the practice deepens, maybe occasionally checking the attitude. Quite simply, is there contraction or ease? What's my relationship? Or what's the relationship of this heart, mind, body to what's actually happening in the present moment? How am I relating to this direct experience? Receiving, receiving. Noticing the reverberations. How's it feel in the body now? And recognizing the residue. I'm receiving two more bells, experiencing the full sound of the bells.
staying with your experience, attuning to the heart, the mind and body as much as is possible as you expand this field of awareness to include movement, really listening to the body. Recognizing how the body wants to be moved and then moving in that way. If you've been sitting cross-legged, it can be really nice to a forward fold. Listening to the wisdom of your own body and recognizing, recognizing what's supportive in this moment. So, I feel a lot of gratitude for the opportunity to offer an environment and a space to reflect on the five precepts and to explore them in greater depth. I feel like sometimes in the insight space, there's not a lot of attention to the precepts. There's, for, there's various theories about why that, why that is the case. And as I get more and more interested in this receptive, reflective awareness practice, I'm interested in really tasting, touching, feeling this conditionality. It's like, oh yeah, (laughs) the precepts just show up as so much more important because they affect how we experience the world so deeply, so deeply. And last time we gathered, I invited everyone to chant the precepts, which I totally loved chanting in the Pali. It's really nourishing for me, but I don't know how it is for other people. So rather than like, you know, really cajoling everyone, which I did very skillfully last week, I would like to see, would people be supported by that? Chanting the precepts together, call and response like we did last time, or hearing me chant them in my off key voice. Or like what mix of that? We're going to do one of those two things. So you can have some choice. We're not skipping that piece, but that's what's next here in, in, my, in my agenda. So let me ask first in the physical space. Um, I'll start with Ron. How would it be for you to engage in call and response of the precepts again in Pali? Supportive or not supportive? Great. Awesome. <laughs> Francis? <laughs> um, sure. Okay. Okay, great. So we'll chant in the space, call and response. And those of you in Zoom land, keep your mics closed because you know how it is. It never comes in at the same time. And please join me in call and response or join us in call and response if you like. And if you don't like, please relax as best you can and receive it and notice how your heart, mind, body responds, right? So all of us, whatever we're doing, that's the primary practice, noticing how the heart, mind, body responds to these foreign poly terms, to these familiar poly terms, and to the English, which will make sense. If I've been making sense, the English will make, will make sufficient sense. And we won't put them on the screen because I still haven't gotten to you the translation that I use, which is like my own morphine of the word. So it's, you know, it's not 100%, but come on, people. This stuff was written down 2,600 years ago, 500 years after the Buddha died. Like, who knows what's like, it's not pure. Like, let's go over ourselves about that. And so how does it 
how is it useful for you and alive in you? So the poly will offer the best that I that I can, and then the English, please know that it's it's um, a valid enough translation, and it's a translation that's really been nourishing me and supporting me. So you're welcome to bring your hands together into a lotus bud if you like. And I know I've been hitting the mic a lot, so if it gets bad, Tia, I can just move it over a bit. Okay, it's been fine. Okay, great. So you can put your hands into a little lotus bud, honoring the potential for awakening for all beings, if you like, or not, right? Full, full, full choice. And I'll go nice and slow. Hmm. Beginning maybe just with a couple breaths or whatever moments of settling into yourself in the moment, checking your posture, Are you in a receptive posture, reminding the heart, mind, and body that that's the primary cultivation is to notice how the heart, mind, and body receive, relate to, and respond to the hearing, to the chanting. Panati Pata Where are money? Sikha Padang Samadhyami I undertake the training To refrain, from, <coughs> to refrain from taking the life of any living being. Adina Dana, where are many? Sikaparang. Samadhyami. I undertake the training to refrain from taking that which is not offered. Tuning into the heart, mind, and body, resting, receiving. Kame su, Michachara, Where are many? Sikaparang, Samadhyami. I undertake the training to refrain from. Unskillful use of sexual energy. Musa Wada Where are many? Sikaparang Samadhyami. I undertake the training to refrain from false or harmful speech. Sura Maria Maja. Pamada Tanha Where are many? Sikapadang Samadhyami I undertake the training to refrain from intoxic excuse me, consuming intoxicants which lead to heedlessness or 
Let me try that again. I've been playing with this one a lot lately. I undertake the training to refrain from consuming intoxicants which lead to carelessness. Those are the five precepts. Noticing what's here in you. Joy, resistance, relief, like, okay, it's all good. And you might have noticed that there are a couple of things that are repeated again and again and again. The first thing that's repeated again and again and again and again. Oh, Walter, you're raising your hand. No, great. The first thing that's repeated again and again is I undertake the training. So I want to spend a little time tonight talking about that. And then the next thing is to refrain from, right? And then there are these five things that we're cultivating our ability to refrain from, or perhaps we're exploring the result of not refraining from or refraining from. Like this can be a very interesting receptive awareness practice, noticing what does this action or non-action lead to? How does it infect me? How does it impact my heart, my mind, my body? Like what happens? And so my plan as I was kind of, you know, burbling around with the idea for this offering, the, these five weeks, this series, was to have one training each week. So that's not quite how it's, how it's unfolded, but oh, we'll have announcement at the end that we're not meeting next week. As was scheduled, it's all of the dates that were announced in the original publication, but just as a reminder, that means not next week. You can come on to the Zoom land at that time. Something amazing will be happening. It's still the same link and everything. It will not be this, but you're very welcome. So that means you've got two weeks before we meet again. So why not play with the first two precepts? You know, like maybe it's worked out just fine. And those first two precepts really simply are, I undertake the training to refrain from taking the life of any living being, literally taking the breath. Uh, you know, like, what would that be like for you? I, I trust that no one has killed anyone recently, you know, maybe in the past and you've done your time and you've cleared your karma and here you are, I don't know, but probably not recently, or at least you got away with it. So great on you, probably wouldn't be here. But maybe, maybe you've engaged in some other kind of act of killing. Um, yeah. I hope to get to talk about that more, but what it, would it be like to reflect on that? Like when you have, when you haven't, how it felt, what would it be like to have the intention for this week to not kill, right? Not to kill the fruit fly, not to kill the paper mite, not to kill the mosquito. I don't know if any of you are in climates where there are mosquitoes at the moment, but like, what would that be like to not kill any living being? Right, and I'm not Jain, and this is not a Jain practice, this is a Buddhist practice, but in the Jain way, that means like not, I was going to bring you some nice fresh carrots from the farmer's market, where they didn't have any, I was a little bit disappointed with the big beautiful greens on them. That means like not eating carrots, not eating onions, because that's taking the life of that plant, right, because that's a root vegetable, right? leafy greens, fine, the plant continues, we just take a little snip, but take up the full root of the carrot. So I'm not suggesting that, although you could play with that if you like, but just to name it, there's a lot of flexibility interpretation and we'll see how the time goes. I'm getting more talking about the precepts in tonight than I got in last week, so that's great. <laughs> great step forward. I do have trainings written out quite fully from the Plum Village community, the tradition of Thich Nhat Hanh, where there's a ton of words for the first train and a ton of words for the second train that get into a lot of nuance. And so we might come to that and we'd be able to read that together to can post that on the screen. But I don't know if we're gonna get there or not. Just, I'll share that with you if you've registered. If you haven't registered and you wanna get that, go ahead and register or give T your email address now, and I will send that to you so that you have it to reflect on if you would like, no requirement. Um, but going back to, so there's lots of room for exploration of what does this mean to cultivate, to undertake the training, right? So 
undertake their training. This is suggesting we're playing, we're exploring, we're like growing and building something. It's not a black and white, all or nothing on or off switch. It's like, it's not thou shalt not kill. Like that is not what it is. And for those who, of us who came from or who live in a Judeo-Christian system and model, it can be really kind of natural to map those two together. And like, that's not what's up, right? That's not what's going on. And so to recognize that is a piece of this exploration. And instead it's this, oh, I'm undertaking a training. It's a North Star, it's a guiding light. What is it like to explore this, to play with this, to investigate how it feels in the heart, mind, and body, to refrain from something, to not do something, to not take life. Life is so precious, right? All of us have been on this earth a minute. As much as I can tell, you know, we don't have any teenagers here or young children. And so you probably have had your share of death. People that you knew well or not so well, maybe a grandparent at the, you know, the outer edge and maybe much closer in. We become as we have, you know, more and more cycles around the sun, more and more cognizant of the fragility of life and the temper, I say temporal nature, I don't know if that's really what I mean, but like the temporary experience of this human life, this human experience. And if you've had the opportunity to be on a meditation retreat, on a Buddhist meditation retreat, you've had time where you were not killing anything. And so maybe you had the experience of, having a mosquito like i remember watching a mosquito do her thing and then of course later learning that it had to be female which was kind of cool like i can gender the mosquito not that i want to gender anybody but it's interesting to not do like the habit languaging of the united states that everything is a he if you don't know what their gender is which i'm so over but to know that oh this is a sign female at birth this creature that's taking blood out of my arm to feed her offspring but she's not taking blood out of my arm to cause me pain or suffering. She's taking blood out of my arm to tend to these beings that she's created. And I remember I was at a Bayagiri in meditation outside of the upper hall where we used, upper platform where we used to meditate before the new buildings were built. And watching this mosquito do her thing. No aversion. And then no bite, Mark. I don't know if that was a correlation or not, but that was so cool. No swelling, no itch. Just watch that. Whenever you, someone probably knows the name of the thing that went into my arm, you know, watch that thing go in and like just syringe out the blood and then fly away. Amazing. I don't need to take her life. What you doing to me? I don't need that blood. I don't. And I, I've had other experiences like that, which are pretty cool too. But sometimes when I do get a bite, if I just clean it, it doesn't bother me. If I just clean it. So I have some story that it's really just like the tiny, tiny infection irritation that's the problem. But I don't know that I haven't checked that at all. Tangent. What would it be like to play with not taking the life of any living being? Just for tonight or day or for this week or for these two weeks. I ask you to play with that as an exploration because I really want to hear about it. So my fantasy would be that then next time we gather, we can go around and hear what was that like to try that on? Where was their ease? Where was their disease? What's your heart, mind, body, gut, neck doing right now as we talk about it, right? Coming back, sometimes the word sati is translated as remember. Right? So remembering to come back like, oh, how am I doing? What's going on? Am I excited about this? Am I like, whatever, I got stuff. You know, like, what is actually here, right? And if we go with the literal translation, as I understand it to be from Ajahn Pasano, of not taking the breath, then we're off the hook on the Jane front. We don't need to be worried about carrots and onions and things like that, sweet potatoes or potatoes, whatever your thing is, right? It's like, oh, I'm not taking the breath of any living being. So if you've had the chance to be on retreat, where you were holding the five precepts or the eight precepts, maybe I've decided that I like to call those things 
temporary terrariums. There's been an insect somewhere and you've trapped it, you've captured it with your little plastic clear see-through object and slid something underneath of it and then taken her outside and released her. And when you're present, or for me anyway, being present to that experience, it touches the seed of compassion in me so deeply. It's so cool. I just notice myself, and I have had the opportunity to spend a lot of time on retreat this last year. So I don't know what happens if you're not on retreat, you just to go for a day or a week. I'm sure it's not the same depth. I, mean, I do know it's not the same depth, but getting this extended time in, the depth of compassion that's touched is like, I save a, a spider or I don't remember where I was, but you know, we all have our bugs that we really don't like. Growing up in Philadelphia and on the East Coast, or in that, uh, growing up in Philadelphia, but this is true outside of Philly too, that region, you know, cockroaches were definitely like the least favorite thing. But here I find that the thing that I really like, I'm still super squeamish about is silverfish. And on retreat recently, there was a, one of like so many, a string of expletives. So my, my formal practice is lying down. If you've been on retreat with me as a retreat until you've seen that, I was lying down. There's a silverfish like right where my head goes on this mat. <laughs> I'm like, ah! <laughs> and like, thankfully the, the temporary terrarium was really close by. So I grabbed it and I like, you know, like got the terrarium on it like super quickly because I did want to save it and I knew I couldn't stand it because I'm freaked out. Like there was a little activation response. I bisected the silverfish. I felt so bad. And I felt so excited and so grateful to feel bad for killing this creature that normally I'm like, oh my God, I'm like, I, like, I, like, I, just, I have to kill it. I don't have to, but my conditioning is at home is that I kill it because I'm terrified, terrified of this tiny, tiny bug. Like, I don't know what my deal is. But the way that it moves, it like just gives me the creepy crawlies. And I, so seeing Walt's eyes closed, I want to offer the re remembering to notice what's going on in your body. How is your heart, mind, body responding to this? I know for me, there's like delight and excitement and like beautiful energy and a little bit more ease and this, like this full range of things. And I felt so much compassion for that creature and so sorry that I had killed it. So I still carefully like scooped it up and took it outside and put it down. And it had some life in it. And it like, you know, it was like, even though it had been cut in half, it was like part of it was still moving. And so like I, I got into like a little nice dark crevice so it could have a little bit of peace for its last bit of time. And to relate in that way to something that I typically, I think probably still have so much aversion to. That's freedom, people. That is freedom. And what if in our lives, like, and as we cultivate that, then in our lives, I am, I see the time to you, then in our lives, our heart minds, it's like, oh, we have greater and greater capacity to meet what's arising inside of us that we might not like so much. Because I know you, you're all humans just like me. You got some stuff in here that you haven't made friends with yet. And this, this possibility of Hmm. Undertaking the training to refrain from taking the life of any living being has the potential to lead to not like hating on and trying to stamp out parts of ourselves. We can accept the fullness of ourselves and another doorway into that accepting the fullness of ourselves is accepting the moment and what it has. What's actually here in this moment right now. And what's here in this moment right now can be, I don't like this. Okay. I don't like this. Okay. It's way different than, I don't like that to get it. Stop, go away. Blah, blah, blah. Like all the papancha, all the proliferation that, that happens if it goes unchecked. But we can check it. We can cultivate our ability to check it. Yeah. So, like I said, no reading of Thich Nhat Hanh and the Plum Village tradition. No engagement with the second <laughs> precept. But... 
full on offering of the first precept, which we didn't get to last week. So I'm very glad to share that with you. And there's way more that I can say. And next time we meet, I'll either talk about the second precept or the third. I'm not sure yet. I will decide. It will become clear. But I, I really appreciate you engaging in the chanting. I feel that it has the possibility of having a very powerful experience. And part of what I'm feeling called to do is to help spread greater access to something closer to the original teachings as best as I understand them, which often is really only available through monastics or through monasteries. And it doesn't need to be like that. You know, I'm not a monastic. I'm not going to be a monastic. This is not a monastery. We're in the middle of the mission. You know, we're in the middle of the city. Um, I'm going to go home to my partner, right? So, yeah, and I had some salmon today. So I engaged in, I supported the killing of a living being, you know? I'm like living my life because if I don't, I'm a crazy person. All right, so enough about that. Thank you so much for your practice and your presence. Let's offer up the merit and then we've got a few announcements. Join in as you like. I'll do this call response too because I don't think it's familiar for that, for that many people. This is from the Plum Village tradition. May the fruits of our practice, May the of our practice be, of to all be of benefit to all beings and bring peace and, bring peace. and liberation to all. <laughs>